It's time for Pure Performance. Get your stopwatches ready. It's time for Pure Performance with Andy Grabner and Brian Wilson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Pure Performance. My name is Brian Wilson, and as always, I have with me my co-host, Andy Grabner, who's making fun of my mustache. <laughs> Andy, I got to tell you, I, I had another dream. I had no, another dream. Another, I, another nightmare? Or was it a pleasure dream? Uh, it was more of an interesting dream. Um, so, yeah, it was not a nightmare. I wouldn't call it a, a, a pleasure dream because you were in it, and that's <laughs> closer to, to, to nightmare, I'd say. Um, but there was nothing actually terrible. So I was, I was outside, and I was looking through my telescope. Yeah, let's see where that's going. I was looking yeah. through my telescope <laughs> at the moon, and suddenly I see a little Andy Grabner running around the moon without mm -hmm. a helmet even. And I'm like, yeah. Andy, you know, I was able to – I yelled up – to the moon, Andy, what are you doing on the moon? And you yelled back, and somehow I could hear you. And uh, you were like, oh, Brian, I am uh, up here on the moon. I'm like, yeah, I could see that, Andy. How, how, how did you get there? What's going on? He's like, well, everybody's going to the moon now. Everyone's making their own rocket ships, so I made my own rocket ship, and I went to the moon. And I was like, y yeah, but, but what are you doing on the moon? And are, are those my kids with you? Why? You, so you still had my kids from from two dreams ago, uh, and I was just really confused as how you could even breathe without the helmet. But really, you know, it, 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 what dawned on me is I was observing you through this telescope on the moon, could somehow communicate with you, get information back from you, and was just astounded that you you did this yourself and you made your own rocket ship and you got there. Um, and then I woke up and I was just confused about why I keep having weird dreams about you, Andy. Yeah. Did I leave a trace on the surface of the moon? No, you magically left no footprints. <laughs> no. It was, yeah, yeah, because I don't know. You're, you're just you know, a magical being, Andy. You know, but for some reason, I think you made this up. I don't know why. Well, there was, I see where you were going. I see where you're going yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah I messed yeah. up your trace pit. Sorry exactly. about that. <laughs> that's okay. <sighs> you're too smart no, for that's me. A, but, that's, but that's a good one. And I, uh, hopefully, if a Roman is listening, because I talked with him uh, the other day. <laughs> yeah. He, he messaged me, which inspired yeah. me to... Uh... <laughs> oh, come up with a dream. Okay, so this is your dream story again. But now, enough with the dreams. Back to reality. Back to observability, <laughs> back to tracing. Back uh, to observability, we didn't even go back, there yet. Yeah, well, you observed me on the moon. I uh, did. We, have a, we have an awesome guest today. He's not only, uh, I, was, I think he's not only an expert in the field that we're talking about today, he's also a book author. Oh. And uh, just recently published the uh, Practical Open Telemetry book, which everybody should definitely take a look at if you're interested in open telemetry. But... Uh, now I think it's really time that I hand the mic over to Daniel Gomez Blanco. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, do us the favor, please introduce yourself to the audience. Hello. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me to your show. I've, um, my name is Daniel. I'm a principal engineer at Skyscanner, and I'm the tech lead for um, observability and like our observability strategy long term. And I recently I've been just leading a, um, a really exciting project that has got to do with us adopting open standards and like trying to rethink how we do observability at Skyscanner. Uh -huh. And what do you think about the, uh, the strange dream story? Was it, was it? <laughs> I can see where that was going. I, can, I was getting the, the, tra the tracing part of it, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I missed the tracing part. I, <laughs> some I was still on the move. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, Daniel, I think we... Um, as I said, we will also leave all the links. Uh, so, folks, if you are, you know, in interested in open telemetry, it's been a topic we've been discussing for for quite a while now, off and on with different experts in the field. Um, but I think we we can never stop educating people about it uh, because it still needs a lot of education. Like Brian and I, we've been talking about performance engineering and performance patterns for so many years, and still we look at applications and are still wondering, does, that, does anybody listen to us because they still make the same mistakes? Um, so um, for me, one of the ways I actually got in touch with you is because I found some of your presentations that you recently did at QCon, as a Recon. And it, for me, it seems that right, we've been in observability for 
I've, I had my 15 years anniversary, so we've been doing this for a while. Brian, you've been around also for very long, right, in our industry. And, and, and for us, it's to be the tracing in the company we work for, right? It's nothing earth shattering new. We've been doing this for a while. But my question to you, Daniel, is why all of a sudden do you think we see such a huge uptick? Observability. Everybody talking about distributed traces. Why? Why did the sudden new hype about this whole thing? Hmm. So I think um, if we go back, I guess ten years, like you know, I think is 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 something that perhaps should have happened before when we started to adopt like you know cloud native deployments, uh, microservice architectures. There are way more components that are you know moving pieces mm -hmm. in these architectures, right? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, over the last ten years, we've been adding more and more. Um, data to our systems in a way that sometimes, you know, if we don't think about tracing, we think about metrics and logs, for example, right? If you take a, a monolith that you had, you know, 20 years ago, and you try to break that down into microservices, but you're still using metrics and logs, then you start to see that, you know, the data that you produce starts to, you know, skyrocket. And mm -hmm. then your engineers can lo no longer make any sense of it really so um so i think there was like a case where like companies that got themselves into that position see that you know the amount of data they've got is too much the um the it's not useful it's not actionable data mm -hmm. most of the time and then um and i think it's been more like um you know the moment that um organizations start to look at that and you know the value that they can get from data that's when they think okay so we need something we need something better something that can describe systems better mm -hmm. and allow us to debug regressions faster. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's that, it's just basically we're, we're getting more deployments, we're getting more, we're getting faster in the way that we deploy, like we're deploying yeah. thousands of times a day, where like before, yeah. you know, maybe some other companies in the past used to deploy, I don't know, once every two months, right? Now we do yeah. it like, you know, dozens or hundreds of times a day. And then with more moving pieces, yeah, you need something better, right? You need, you yeah. need observability. Yeah. So basically things got out of hand almost. And then we needed to find a way to better control, better specify and standardize the way we do it. I mean, I actually thought you went into a different direction when you started th when you started talking about in the old days, right? Where we, I think we had obviously simpler systems. And I remember Brian, when we started, we started observability and kind of distributed tracing back in the days when the world was dominated by Java. Right. I mean, it was, yeah, but in the beginning, everybody in, the, in, in our industry started building yeah. agents for Java. Mm -hmm. And with that, you covered a, a, a huge ground, right? And then dot, mm -hmm. maybe edit.net. And then, Daniel, what you said, I thought was really interesting because now with, with kind of, uh, you know, containerized systems and you having Kubernetes and everybody can basically pick from, from, from not hundreds, but many, many different runtimes that fit their needs. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to write, I guess, agents for all these technologies. And therefore, I really like that we have come to a situation where we say, okay, we need to standardize, uh, first of all, what we collect, how we collect it, but also I think need to give the power back to the people that actually build these systems and build these fr frameworks and applications and put their instrumentation in instead of uh, relying on some vendors to figure out a way how to reverse engineer runtimes. Mm -hmm. vendors or even like you know the engineers themselves like you know you've got if you um let's say if you're only relying on open source software it mm -hmm. may be up to the the engineer that is using a particular library to add the telemetry to it because that library doesn't produce any metrics right and it makes sense because if you're the author of a library what do you use do you use prometheus do you use statsd do you use like you know it's very difficult for a library like author to decide mm -hmm. on what SDK, what metrics client to use, for example. But like, you know, when you think about open telemetry, you've got libraries that can describe themselves and then mm -hmm. have the, 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 the user of the library decide how they want to export that data. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is what, what is this all about? Like, you know, is when you've got all those different moving parts and you've got systems and libraries that, that describe themselves in the way that the author intended, there's no need for, you know, someone else to come after and try to sort of mm -hmm. like add telemetry on top. So that's an interesting um, feature or an interesting uh, uh, feature of open telemetry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what I would be interested in, so and we, we talked about this a little bit in, in the preparation for this. Um, so you have the book out there, Practical Open mm -hmm. Telemetry, and, and writing a book on a topic A that is so new and is so fast moving. 
I mean, isn't it how how do you what 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 is covered in the book that 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 won't age? Let's say that well, it's three it pages be, long, right? It's three pages long, and then he just publishes a new addendum. Pretty much. It's, it, is, it, is, it was challenging. I think from the moment that I started writing the book to the moment that I finished, like things moved. In the, um, well, especially in the, um, in the logs, in the log inside, which is the, the area of open telemetry that is still experimental in some ways, not stable, not fully stable, at least from the point of view of APIs. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so there are parts of the book that are, um, that are stable. Like the metrics mm-hmm. API, the tracing API, those part, the baggage API, all those parts of the open telemetry API are stable. Um, the SDKs that come with them as well are stable. And open telemetry does provide some really strong stability guarantees on these mm-hmm. libraries. So if you, you know, you can take long-term dependencies on it. And in a way, my book is taking long-term dependencies on, on these APIs, right? Um, I mean, it does, uh, at the, in the intro, it does mention at what point it was written and to what point it was um, compatible with. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, so the, the the stabilization of metrics and traces was probably what made, you know, at that point it made sense to create a book. Now we've got the the login API that is a lot more stable than when I started writing it. Um, but yeah, so I think um, if you look at the concepts around metrics of the API and the concepts around traces, all those will be stable. How you integrate with open telemetry collectors will be stable as well. And even mm-hmm. and the protocols that are used to um to publish and to export this data is all stable. And then there is a bit in the in the book that is not really really I mean it's related to open telemetry, but the start and the, the and the beginning of the book is related to observability in general and how you can um, roll out a an observability function within your organization and how to to make engineers adopt best practices. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there are bits in it that are not specific to open telemetry as well. Mm. And that's actually, thanks for this perfect segue almost, because this is what I wanted to talk about. Uh, I mean, obviously for open telemetry itself, there's a lot of information out there online in the communities. Uh, folks, if you're listening in and you want to learn more about open telemetry and you don't know where to start, we put a lot of links uh, on the in the description of the podcast and obviously, you know, start with the book, Practical Open Telemetry. But uh, as you said, Matt, many organizations are currently trying to figure out what does this all mean. Um, how, how do you you just you just said how to build an observability function? Um, how do you convert from maybe something that you used to do to to using you know open standards now? Where do you start? Are there what are, what are best practices? How do you get started? Like looking at your own history at Sky uh, at Skyscanner, can you share some of the of the thoughts that went into what was a good starting point? What type of people did you need? What type of practices? You know, how what did you set some goals to say, hey, in a year we need to be there or anything yeah, so we, could be really helpful? Yes, yeah, so we had a really complex I mean at Skyscanner, we always relied on open source um uh, libraries, open source tooling to for anything related to telemetry. We were integrated with some some vendors um in the past, but um but in general we we try to basically run everything in-house. And um, and this basically, we we started with when we started to adopt open telemetry. We started with tracing. Now, mm-hmm. two reasons for that. The first one being, um, is it was the most stable signal at the time. The second one being that we were already relying on open tracing. Mm-hmm. So if you're like open telemetry being the merger of open tracing and open sensors to other projects. So if you're like a user of open sensors or of open tracing, you're gonna have a really easy migration path. And this is um, this is intended, but as well, it shows the value of the API design of open telemetry. So you've got that mm-hmm. separation between the API and the implementation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, open tracing already had that same design. And uh, for us to basically adopt open tracing, we could sort of do it pretty much under the hood. So you can just apply a shim and that says, every time you call the open tracing API, that will be translated into the open telemetry um, API mm-hmm. call, right? Um, so there is a lot of, as well in the industry, in the tech industry, you've probably had guests on your podcast as well that talk about platform engineering as a, as a discipline, right? Mm-hmm. As Skyscanner, we have been invested in platform engineering for a long time. And when we were approached with the decision to adopt open telemetry, we already had things in place, like for example, um, internal a set of internal libraries that we can roll out to mm-hmm. across the company, and they contain some 
standard and default config for libraries, right? So for us to migrate to open telemetry, the tracing part to open telemetry was pretty much a minor version bump of that internal library that said, well, now you configure the open tracing API like this. And then people could start to basically gradually move to open telemetry. Mm -hmm. Now, um, now that was the easy part, let's say. <laughs> you've got a new technology, you've got tracing, you've got support for, you know, um, for open telemetry and everything is is uh, is all rainbows and and uh, it's all nice. Now the 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 hardest part I think to adopt is when you've got a legacy system or a system that's been running for 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 years and that you know mm. their engineers are used to using metrics and logs and that's it, no tracing. So then how do you go about approach you know instrumenting a service like this one? And this is where you know there is a lot of education that's needed, a lot of enablement as well, but education on what is the best signal to use for a specific concept, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you've got something like open telemetry that allows you to use any of these three main signals, like traces, metrics, and logs, how do you know which one to use for something? And this is where like, you know, um, this is what I wanted to take my book into that sort of like aspect of like, okay, you've got all these things, but if you want to, I don't know, like look at requests for a particular service, do you add it as a metric, do you add it as a trace, what sort of information do you put in each of the signals? And um and then basically that's the um that's the part that we're sort of like still going through now in Skyscanner is like adopting metrics and then having to review some of the metrics that were produced by your application, right? Some of them could have been really high cardinality metrics because there was nothing else and they were used to debugging that. And maybe like you can stop producing those really high cardinality metrics and then link to traces, which have that sort of like really granular view that you're interested in for debugging. And then maybe drop some of the logs and also rely on tracing. So it's like, you know, that sort of like re-instrumentation of services is, is quite really, it's, it's challenging for teams, but there is a lot of return on investment here on using um, each signal for its purpose. Mm -hmm. So the... the I hope I don't divert now, but I think you just triggered something in my head. Uh, mm -hmm. Talking about what to choose, metrics and traces. And I give you a practical example. The metric of response time, right? We are interested in response time of transactions. So mm -hmm. I think there's two ways we could do this, right? We are capturing a metric. And for every single request that comes in, we then, you know, say, hey, you know, this is the response time. And then we have high cardinality and we can calculate all of the... Uh, you know, your, your min, your max, your averages, your percentiles and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. If you don't choose a metric for this because you say, why do I need a metric? Because I have it on the distributed trace anyway, because if I start a trace at the beginning of the transaction, then the duration of the trace basically gives me the response time as well. Right? So that would be, I guess, an argument to say, why capture things twice if you have already have it on the trace? Right? Um, yes, I think, you know, there is, a, there is a reason for that, though. I think there is as well... Um, sort of like a view of like, okay, well, you only need tracing. We've got tracing now and we only need tracing. And I, I personally disagree with that a little bit because mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, when you've got metrics, when you've got a service that is producing, you know, thousands of spans per second, but you've got metrics that can aggregate a lower, um, mm -hmm. sort of like a lower cardinality, like you can, the, the pipelines that you use to explore these metrics or the, the retries that you can have on, on a specific data point, or even like if you use Prometheus, for example, or like cumulative counters, like the way that the metrics are designed, they're more stable. They will produce a more stable signal than traces or spans. And if you've got then sampling applied on top of spans, which I think, you know, we can go into sampling later as a way to only keep the data that you, that you care about, that you can aggregate those metrics, have all the events count, but in one aggregated data point, and then link to individual examples that are in traces that will allow you to debug sort of like further mm -hmm. deeper down mm -hmm. and save costs and or save transfer payloads and, and so on like basically optimize what you're actually storing and what you're actually mm -hmm. sending over the wire well thanks for the dance because that was I, I hoping you're going this direction because that's exactly what we have seen in our experience right because as, as sampling at some point comes into play uh, you would basically lose a certain level of visibility and accuracy. Um, and I think this is something that where I believe what you're doing with the book, what you're doing in the community, what we're doing here with the podcast is so important that we make people 
aware of this because I think a lot of people are now entering the observability space and may not have thought about these implications, right? If, because on a Hello World app, everything works perfectly. <laughs> but yeah. in a in a in a high in a put like if you look at I guess in your environment, right? That at Skyscanner you have you have high transaction volume, and then the question is: Do we really need to capture? Can we even capture? Is it cost efficient to capture every span? Yeah, it's not, not. I mean, it's, it's not. It's uh, we. I can give you some like like details off the top of my head, and that is like because you think about Skyscanner, it's you know we receive what well, we have a, an average of um, over a hundred million monthly active users, right? But then when you think about the internal systems, because it's, you know, as a, as a, as a travel search engine for flights, hotels, car rentals, every time that someone searches for something, you know, you need to call multiple partners, multiple airlines. So it's like a, it's like basically like a fan out sort of thing, right? So the amount of traffic that goes on in, internally in the systems is you know, it could be like hundreds of times higher than you see from like when you normally interact with that, you know, if you've got a service or a system where it's like a normal user interaction with the system mm -hmm. itself. Yeah, we here have like, you know, thousands of partners that, that could be uh, that could be called. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so in terms of like, you know, we produce around 1.8 million spans per second that goes through our collectors. Now that is, that's a lot of data and a lot of data that most of that it's probably not that useful for debugging mm -hmm. because it is normally, you know, it would correspond to successful requests or to requests that completed in a acceptable amount of time, right? So like mm -hmm. the ones that are not really that useful for debugging, you want mm -hmm. to keep those in the metrics. I mean, you want to know about the general state, but then, you know, not that useful for debugging. So, uh, so yeah, so I, I Skyscanner, we use tail base sampling, which is where like mm -hmm. in traces where you can look at the whole trace and then try to, you know, you can just basically make a decision looking mm -hmm. at a whole trace instead of like one particular service. And we tend to keep around between four and 5% of all the, of all the traces. Mm -hmm. And this is enough. This is enough because it contains all the traces that contain a single error. It contains the slow traces and a random percentage of the rest, right? Mm -hmm. And if we need to store more, we can store more, but like generally that's what we, that's what we keep. And, um, and we've seen as well teams that migrated from logging to tracing, like, you know, basically, and get more, get better observability. Not, it's not like they stopped doing logging, but for example, they stopped like right. debug level, mm -hmm. transactional, like logging, and they started to rely on tracing and not, they just didn't get better observability. They reduced their operational costs as well, which is, you know, mm -hmm. a benefit on both sides. No, I, I think there's another big aspect with the, you know, the, the metric versus the trace there is just the simplicity, right? I mean, metrics, any, if you're going to get a response time from the traces, you're basically going to turn that into your own metric, which means now you have to add some calculation layer to it. And you're also going to not have every single data point on a chart or something, right? So you're going to do maybe a one second, 10 second, 30 second resolution, and well, the, the metrics already there. It's 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 already done. So why would you need to reinvent that? Um, uh, yeah, the, and the, even with the logging thing too, this this comes up all the time. There's the the idea of use log. Logs are still relevant, right? People still use logs plenty. I know back in the old days, Andy and I used to hear like, "Oh, we don't need logs," and then our developers were like, "No, we still need logs." And we've had some podcasts of like when we started adding logs back into our mm. platform. It's like, well, yeah, no, people still need logs, but mm. you need logs for certain things. If you have traces, you can get that information from the trace, which you're already collecting. This way you can save on your, your log stores by saying, what are the things that we can only get from logs? What are the use cases that are specific to log? And let's fo keep the logs focused on that. And let's mm. leverage these other things that are going to have a bunch of other rich additional contextual data in it to... Um, for those other pieces, right? I don't need that in a debug log, right? Yeah. For instance, exactly. There is a, there's as well another benefit of logs and how they integrate with Open Telemetry is that um, you have legacy legacy systems that you know the, the you know their libraries may not be instrumented for Open Telemetry or for tracing, right? But thanks to these sort of like correlation and semantic conventions as well, you can then instrument your logs so that they appear next to your traces. Right, mm -hmm. um, which 
as you know, is not a use case per se, but it's like, you know, something that, you know, for it may ease the way for a lot of people that say, well, I mean, you still get that, you know, information from logs attached to your traces, which I think it's it's great to basically try to give more context around these anomalies that you can find from tracing data that you couldn't find from logs. Yeah. Hey, I got to jump back to something you said earlier, because remember, maybe not everybody's completely familiar with, with all the terminology. Mm -hmm. um, you said you're capturing about 4 to 5% of your spans, and mm -hmm. uh, because they contain enough error. You mentioned tail-based sampling. Yeah. Could you just explain what tail-based sampling means? Again, remember, yeah, there's so some there people is... that may have never heard about it. Yeah, there is two generally two forms that you can do sampling, right? The first one is probability sampling. So you've got, um, and you can think about if, if you think about logs, for example, the only way that you can do sampling on logs is probability sampling. So mm -hmm. you've got, you know, a percentage of logs that you want to keep. In the same way that you can apply that to your traces, you want you know, percentage of traces that you want to keep. Um, now you may you may be able to say, well, if there are error, for example, error level um, logs. You may want to keep 100% of them, but only 20% of the debug logs. But then the problem is that when there is an error, you actually want the debug logs. So that's why people don't end up like sampling debug logs is because they actually need them. So with, some, with, with tracing, when you think about probabilistic sampling, it does give you a bit more, which is that you can actually say, if you if you want to store a trace, you can store the whole trace. And that means that spans from every service that a transaction went through, right? So you're going to keep the whole trace. The way that tracing does it is like you can propagate that decision. So when in the same way that you propagate a trace, you can propagate that decision. So if you have a a, a server request, a, a server that is accepting a request and says, well, I want to sample 20% of the traces, then when it makes the decision to sample, it can then uh, propagate that decision downstream. And that's powerful by itself. But it's still probabilistic. You're basically saying, I want to keep 20% of the traces, and that's it. Um, with tail based sampling, um, it is a bit more difficult to implement because it does require you to have an external component that all your spans for a particular trace go through. So think about, you know, you've got uh, three services in a, in a trace, each of them will be producing their spans. You need to feed all the spans through one single replica of something of a collector or some other way of like, you know, multiple vendors will provide their own mm -hmm. tail base sampling as well. But you need to send it to all the spans to one single point, all the mm -hmm. spans for a trace. So when you, when one of those samplers, which could be an open telemetry collector, gets a trace, gets the first span for the trace, it starts a, a, a counter basically. And then when that, it, it starts to keep all the spans in memory for that particular trace. And when the counter comes to the end, they can say the open telemetry collector or whatever sampler, it can say, okay, I'm looking at the whole spans, at all the spans mm -hmm. in this trace. And I can say, well, if there was any error, for example, in this mm -hmm. whole trace, I keep the trace. If there's no mm -hmm. errors, well, then I look at the uh, duration of the whole trace. If it goes mm -hmm. over a particular threshold, then I'll keep it. If not, then, I, then I'll discard it. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you can as well do a bit of uh, probabilistic sampling there. But the um, but the idea here is that you can look at the whole trace mm -hmm. because the, mm -hmm. at the spans from multiple services at the same time, and then decide if you want to keep them or not. Mm -hmm. Cool. So that's so, we, we think that is that is very powerful because that is, it is yeah. You you end up basically only storing the data that is useful and then discarding the rest. Yeah. Would you also keep? I imagine you'd probably also keep ones that are running nom like nominally, so that you can yeah. compare bad to the standard, right? So it's going to be a mix of types, not just keeping bad, right? You'd want to keep some of the standards so you understand what it should look like, right? Yeah, so you want to keep a percentage yeah. of the good ones as well, just to understand what good yeah. looks like. But yeah. mm -hmm. um, coming back to uh, something that we also discussed in preparation of this, and you know, the people that are uh, building in open telemetry or any type of, of observability data are in the end going to be the developers, right? The developers that have their own, they, they want some information from their own code or developers that are building frameworks uh, that is then used. They're the ones that know their code best and they know what they need. Are there, is there good enough best practices out there 
to uh, to either tell developers what is what is a good what is good to instrument and also what is not good to instrument, or is there any tooling out there that actually looks at at traces and says, hey, you know what, this is actually you know useless information, or it's too much, or it's dangerous information. It might be secure. It's like confidential information uh, because I always worry that we what what we've seen in our in our world 15 years ago when the when our product or also 10 years ago when our product was was much different we had the option to say uh instrument everything so we could we we could uh, specify uh method uh method matchers or rules and you could do uh, what we call the shotgun instrumentation shotgun meant you know everything in a certain package or maybe somebody could do a star dot star and then everything got instrumented and basically, that was extremely powerful and great for some in a certain environment, but in production, obviously, would kill everything because it just a lot of overhead costs. You name it. Yeah. Is there are there are there good enough best practices out there? A for developers to find, or B, um, what can developers do to validate if they're doing a good enough job? Is there any validation of the instrumentation? Um, yeah, that's a difficult question, actually, because I think that that is um, in the if you look at the some of the open telemetry instrumentation libraries, right? Um, you mm -hmm. take the Java age, the open telemetry Java agent, um, by default, it will um, auto instrument every single library that that it knows how to auto instrument, right? Mm -hmm. That could be a lot of information. That could be certainly something that you know you want to use to to test it and to sort of like roll it out if you're perhaps in a small sort of like volume or small traffic but when you think about rolling it out um at an organizational level then you've got a you've got a decision to make which is what which ones which ones of these libraries you want to un instrument or which ones of these settings you want to apply now there is good news here as well. Um, as like the tooling is there, as in like Open Telemetry does provide the tooling for you to like disable, enable, disable things. Mm -hmm. In general, like what I've seen is not um, if there is anything that could be potentially be sensitive information is normally disabled by default. Like you know, storing headers, for example, or things like that are not normally stored by default. Um, but then there's a lot of things that you could maybe decide to to disable. So the way that we do it at Skyscanner is we've got our internal basically like an open telemetry distro that for those that don't know what an open telemetry distro is is uh, you will see multiple vendors will have their open telemetry distro it's not a different implementation of open telemetry it's just a sort of package configuration mm -hmm. that you know what components are going to integrate better with that particular vendor um the way that we do it at um a sky scanner is we have our own so sort of like default and uh when we roll out open telemetry we roll it out with the minimal required and by minimal required, we mean we want the HTTP clients to be instrumented. Mm -hmm. We want the servers to be instrumented. We want some internal, like middleware, for example, internal libraries to be instrumented. But in general, we don't instrument all. And then, you know, because there is a lot of a lot of things that we want to roll out by default and then allow service owners to, to add their own, to be able to mm -hmm. configure their own. And the way to look at it, I guess, is uh, is how basically... Is what's useful to you to debug your service. That's that's going to be very much dependent on on each service owner. Um, there is also good news on the metric side. I was talking mostly about traces here, but on the metric side, um, one of my favorite things actually of open telemetry uh, metrics is the concept of metric views, um, mm. which allow you to let's say that you're a library author and you say, I want to instrument this client, this HTTP client, and I want to put every single, like, I don't know, URL in it, which is not a semantic convention anymore. But like, let's say that, you know, someone says, I want to put every single URL in a metric as a tag. Now, you, that could be a really high cardinality tag mm -hmm. if you've got the URL in it. Now, with metric views, what you can do is you can just go and um, remove that and basically re-aggregate the metric at the service level without having to change how the metric is instrumented. So that leaves the, the developer of the library with like the option to say, these are all the things that are, you should care about, but then you as a service owner, uh, you can just say, well, actually, you know, I want you to re-aggregate that into less dimensions and then push that those data points out. So this is the work that, you know, if you've got a, a big organization, it's probably good to invest in some 
to like I like to call it telemetry enable telemetry enablement. Right, right, right. But it's basically, you know, you need a set of people that know what they're doing and that know how things are instrumented and then can provide these defaults mm-hmm. and say like, you know, this is a default um metric view for this particular library, right? And then that's something that you can roll out internally at you know, across multiple teams. Because not everyone has the time to go and look at this. Yeah. And there yeah. is, yeah. I'm of the approach that is is good to have that minimal instrumentation, minimal telemetry, and then allow sort of like service owners to add their enable what they need then later. Mm-hmm. Do you see do you see any testing that is necessary for open tele for the telemetry data? Meaning are there like we do functional testing and unit testing, do we need to do telemetry testing so that we actually make sure we get the right telemetry before we push it into production? Have you seen this? Yeah, I've seen, yeah. Even when like, I think that's especially when you've got the, a good practice is to extrapolate, right? So you, you can instrument your service with a particular library, you run it in your test environments, see what telemetry they produce, um, you run it then if you've got a pre-prod environment or like a canary deployment, something like that, you can run it there and then say, well, if this is producing this amount of telemetry, is that useful for me to debug? Mm-hmm. Is, that, is it useful data? And then try to basically get the value of like, how much is this going to cost me? Mm-hmm. As a, you know, compared to like, is it really useful data that is producing? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like um, observing, observing the observer, really yeah, making sure it's well. <laughs> There is as well um, things that you can do when when people are instrumenting their services and adding spans or manual manual instrumentation. Um, specific, I think probably more uh, related to spans is the ability to test that in your unit tests as well. Something that we do, Skyscanner, um, you can have an in-memory um, exporter. So then mm-hmm. you can use that in testing and say, what spans were generated during this unit test? Is that what you're expecting or is... Mm-hmm context being propagated correctly and that you can you can you can start to look at it that way as well mm. yeah, especially because you know telemetry data is is now also woven into and used by not only let's say the developers for troubleshooting or for ops teams but also by your devops tool itself we mentioned canary deployments right we have automated canary analysis tools where your 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 CADA, your hba your auto scaling right they rely on accurate telemetry data, and if your mm-hmm. telemetry data is not is not good, then they these tools may make wrong decisions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that that's a that's a big point. Um, so kind of the quality quality of observability, kind of even like how can you you, you need to validate that the quality is right and that you have the right data in the right quality. Um, the the metrics view uh, is an interesting concept, and I would like to ask one more question because you said. Um, you can define a view and then the aggregation happens. Uh, does the aggregation happen in the app itself then? That means it's on the client side where it's collected or does it happen in the, in the, uh, in the collector? Where does it happen? Uh, it would happen on the, on the client side. So on the individual service replica where that has been generated. So okay. um, it's, a, it's basically um, the way that the API works is quite interesting. It's a new, for me, that was a new concept as well, which is the, the, um, the the separation between measurements and their aggregation because mm-hmm. when you think about i don't know the usual like prometheus clients you you basically get a counter you add it and then just you know get aggregated there in, in memory and then you export it or well, it gets scraped in the case of prometheus um with the new relic api um what you're doing is like you're you're adding a measurement but the 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 way that these measurements are aggregated is configured a startup an application startup so that's that's what the view does really. It just mm-hmm. informs the SDK, the open telemetry SDK, to say, well, this is how you will aggregate these measurements. And you could even change it's just, you know, you could even change the the type. You can basically if you've got a histogram like the whatever library author said, I I'm gonna instrument this as a histogram. But mm-hmm. you may not need a histogram and you just need a counter, so you can even change the the aggregation type, right? So you can say, I just need mm-hmm. a counter for this. And then mm-hmm. normally as that's a bit of a niche use case, probably not that, not that common, but you know, it could uh, changing the type of uh, aggregation is quite powerful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I got two, three more quick questions for you. Um, and also coming back to what you said in the in the beginning, or we also discussed this in our prep call. Uh, from an adoption perspective, I see, especially in, in enterprises that have had software for a long, long time and still running, right, a lot of, let's say they're quote-unquote legacy for the lack of a better term, software, mm-hmm. that, that may never, right, that they... Either they don't they don't have the source code, they didn't write it, but they just run it, and there's no way for them to ask their um, their supplier to pull in open telemetry because what is the benefit for them, or and is it worth the cost? Right? Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe also some. I think I brought up this use case that I ran into with a client where they said, "Hey, our software is using this library, but we cannot use." the latest version because we're running on an older version of another library and therefore we have a certain dependency so we cannot upgrade to something that is instrumented with open telemetry already so we have a we have a gap. Um, and so this is also why then we still you know need auto instrumentation. And mm-hmm. fortunately there are some auto instrumentation uh, agents available now in open telemetry as well, which may fill this gap, but what do you think needs to happen in order to completely fill this gap? Or what can we do to encourage people to uh, to also some maybe touch some old code and actually instrument those libraries? Um, it, because we want to make sure that that enterprises that have these legacy systems running around that they can also benefit from open telemetry from distributed tracing end to end. Yeah, so I think well the first thing is communicating value, right? Which is every single one of these discussions should start with like, what is the value in doing this? Um, and then now that's, that's why, you know, there's so much good content out, you know, um, out there basically to say, this is the value of open standards. This is mm-hmm. the value of, um, correlation of signals of like, you know, using open telemetry semantic conventions and so on. So, um, so I guess, you know, the, if you've got an old framework that needs to be instrumented, we'll try to basically get, well, start those discussions with um, with different well vendors or different um library um, maintainers to to make them instrumented with open telemetry now there are things it's not always possible but in some cases there are ways that you can still use open telemetry semantic conventions with for example things like logs right we just said you can start to use some semantic conventions around um the logs that you produce so they can get um, added to or correlated mm. to traces, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and there is also the open telemetry collectors, which um, allow you to re- receive some of that data that may be produced in a, I don't know, some of the older sort of like ways of exporting mm-hmm. metrics, for example, right? StatsD or, or well, not old, like mm-hmm. some other ways like Prometheus, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Or, or, they're, or they're basically clients. Some of that, there's like so many, like 80 different receivers like open telemetry collector receivers which can either Mm -hmm. scrape or or receive data in a format and then you can do a lot of processing within these collectors to to put that you know to add those semantic conventions those attributes that will allow you to then um not just you know produce it in a in a standard format but also be able to put it in context with other open telemetry data from an operational perspective, what is more challenging? What do you see? Is it to get open telemetry into the client app to actually generate the traces or to operate and run all of the collectors and the infrastructure that stores the data? Um right, I was gonna go to a third thing, which is like okay, the yeah. hardest thing, but you know, the, the in terms of like, you know, the I think the the the, the open telemetry collectors are easy to run. They're just super efficient. We run them, as I said, you know, we run um, a set of like collectors as a gateway that accept those 1.8 million spans per second and and metrics are now ramping up as well. Um, and they run with like those, I don't know, in, in total across all of our clusters, I think it's less than 125 cores. So it's like mm-hmm. quite small uh like CPU uh, utilization for the amount of data that they, that they, that they, you know, mm-hmm. chunk through. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and even like generating metrics and spans, they're not just basically passing data through, they're actually doing things with the, with the data. Um, but I was going to say the most difficult part perhaps is the human part of, <laughs> of things. As usual, you know, technology is easy, it's humans that are hard, right? Mm-hmm. Is how to change those 
best those practices of debugging. Right? We've got, mm-hmm. for example, a sky scanner. We made it super easy for people to um, to go and well use tracing data. Like most teams use it, but there will be you know we've got a lot of different teams, and there will be some teams that even though they've got the tracing data, they've got a RAM book that says you go to this dashboard and you go to logs, and you know that mm-hmm. you, they're not used to it because you know that's the way that they've been operating their service for for years. So is that mm-hmm. sort of like changing those patterns of um, you know mm-hmm. using using observability data is, is probably the most challenging part, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely see that one all the time where we're engaging with customers and they get these traces, mm-hmm. but yet they say, "Well, we we really haven't looked at it much because every time there's an issue, we just jump back to logs what we know to, what to do." And there's that idea, okay, well, if you practice the new style for a little bit, there might be a little a bit of a pain. It's, it's that transition. Oh. It, it's the, the culture yeah. that's got to change in the transition and try this. And then once you get to that and you get comfortable with that, you're going to find it so much more efficient. But how do you get somebody, especially in the heat of the moment when something's blowing up? Like, I know I can go here. It might take yeah. me three times as long, but I know what I'm doing as opposed to trying this new thing. And that, yeah, that's extremely challenging. So... I think the practice there is finding a time for people to play or to experiment and poke around when there's not a fire, right? Yeah. It's to find dedicated time to look into those uh, situations. But, yeah. I actually have a quote. I think there's a quote in my book about that. It says like, uh, the firefighter doesn't wait until the house is on fire to learn how to use a fire engine, right? So mm-hmm. then there is some training needed as well. Um, yeah. And uh, and I think, you know, like we, we've started to do that. So like try to apply that concept a sky scanner as well having some sort of like um trip well game days or you know like mm-hmm. just basically um mm-hmm. teams looking at their telemetry um something that i'm really keen on starting to do is having multiple teams looking at their telemetry together mm-hmm. because then that 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 has I'm, i've seen that happening not with the whole team but with one engineer from one particular area and another engineer from other area. Now they're both part of the same transaction, but the certain, the services are part of the same transaction, but they're mm-hmm. different teams. And then mm-hmm. when they start to talk about telemetry, they're all like, oh, actually, I didn't know my endpoint was being called by your service or that this endpoint was being called by your service and that was part of this particular, you know, user journey. And uh, mm-hmm. it's really interesting, the conversations that can, that can come out of that. Mm-hmm. And I think out of that actually comes another cool thing. If you start to learn about your quote unquote users or customers from your API mm. and you see when something breaks, why it breaks, you can also start thinking about kind of system boundaries and then define good SLAs and SLOs and actually start measuring the right things and then get, uh, get right alerting in and all that, right? I mean, that's, that's a big topic. Um, Daniel, um, I know we are getting close to the end of the hour here, but if you look ahead a year from now, and if you would, if you know, let's assume you will write a second edition of your book, <clears throat> um, not because you need to keep it up to date, but you're writing new stuff. What do you think would be in your book? What are the things that are still struggling in your current role or in your current situation? What are the things that you have not solved yet that you need to solve this year that you want to write about how you solved it? I think it would probably be, uh, and this is an idea that where this is an idea where open telemetry is putting a lot of effort now is in the the client side part of things, the, the front end, browser, mobile instrumentation, mm-hmm. um, and then how do we get that? Basically, how do we get what we have in the back end in terms of like correlation, like context, and all that to mm-hmm. to mobile and to browser in a way that is you know integrated with open standards and so on. So. Mm-hmm. Um, how do we basically move that context as well to the back end so propagate all that context and start to basically get an idea of what our users are really experiencing mm-hmm. so um you know we've got something for example we've got call wet vitals as something that you know mm-hmm. we all care about because google says so mm-hmm. uh, and it is, it is a really you know genuine what good way of of a certain user experience right those three mm-hmm. metrics Mm-hmm. Um, but there's so much more that could be done to basically assert like what users really care about and then mm-hmm. correlate that to back-end performance as well. 
So I think that's an area where I'm really looking forward to, yeah, next next year, next couple of years, it was coming. And then, you know, get the whole view of of contextualized data from mm -hmm. the from the customer, from the user to the to the database, right? Mm -hmm. Sounds like describing a product that we work with on a daily basis. <laughs> 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 no, but it's the standard, right? I mean, that's the nice it's thing. The sta yeah, it's the standard, yeah. I think. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. yeah. And also, like, well, when we when we can get, this is another area where it is related to this as well. You yeah. mentioned that SLOs, um, try to get SLOs for that, for basically that product-driven, right? You've got yeah. your SLOs that are, you know, that product product people, product owners, product managers care about. And then, you know, where you start basically looking at product health in a way that is, you know, driven by SLOs and then get that sort of like view of like, there is an SLO that's about to break and then you get you get into the metrics and then vendors like, you know, they start to basically give that, when we were talking about workflows or um, mm -hmm. um, run books, basically get those Without having to run to write a run book, because mm -hmm. I think writing detailed run books is is a losing game. You're never going to write the perfect run book, but mm -hmm. if you can have a, a you know data that is there correlated that a vendor can use to drive drive you through the SLO to metrics to traces to logs and all that in context, that will there's there's still a lot of work to do there. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Daniel, did we miss anything? Did you miss any topic? that you wanted to make sure our listeners are aware of as they embark on their journey towards adopting open telemetry. Mm -hmm. Besides obviously so. looking at your book, because that's where all the wisdom yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think so. I think um, perhaps the um, the cost distribution, but I think we talked about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, are you going? I know you presented at SRECon and at, at QCon. I didn't uh, actually. I don't have, um, I didn't present at SRECon. I presented at, um, well, recently at QCon. I presented at OliFest before. Oh, OliFest. So. Sorry, that was my mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, any other, uh, conference presentations coming up this year? Uh, not yet. I've been invited to a couple, but like, I also, like, have a, a lot of work to do at Skyscanner to to oh, adopt yeah. open standards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Brian, any final words from you? Any new dream that uh, that came up in your mind? Well, the only dream I have is still one I th th thought I saw in your notes and we didn't really tackle is I remember when Open Telemetry was first coming out, there was this promise of all these vendors were going to be baking Open Telemetry code into their runtimes and everything and if it's happening, I haven't seen it yet, but I haven't seen everything, obviously, but it's not seen it in the common stuff yet and hoping that still comes because I think that'll just make it so much easier for everyone, you know, mm -hmm. and it'll be based on the vendor's best practices for what's going to be most useful. Um, the other thing, I, I like what you said, Daniel, earlier. I remember reading an article about this way back as you kept on talking about collecting all this data and collecting all this data and it could be, to, you know, overload uh, from a data point of view. And I think, you know, one of the most important components of observability is turning the data into information which you know there's some great articles out there i can't remember the one i read way back um but it was just you know going through the difference between data which is just data points right and information which is turning it into something useful and open telemetry obviously is going to help you turn it capture all the data and it's going to be up to you to turn that into useful information and find ways that you can leverage that within your organization to 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 make those improvements. So that's yeah. that's I mean, the my, other key component to it. My hope is that we can get um, vendors like the, the effort that you that vendors used to basically get on running their own instrumentation agents and their own APIs and SDKs. You know, when right. vendors move towards open standards for like instrumentation and the API and SDK, hopefully all that extra like um, engineering time is. It's put onto using that data, that standardized yeah. data, and making you know making it valuable. Awesome. That's mm. all I had, though, Andy. Uh, hopefully, I'll have yeah. an, another dream for the next episode, <laughs> 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 which I believe is actually also another session on open telemetry. 
yeah. uh, because it's going to be practical implementation tips from one of our users out there on how they, they implemented OpenTelemetry. So OpenTelemetry is a hot topic and we are trying to do whatever we can to educate the world. Um, a final statement I want to make, and, and we discussed this also in the, in the in the prep call, I think we as vendors that have been in the space for so long, we're really looking forward to open telemetry um, because I think it, it helps us to really focus our engineering efforts on whether we can really make a difference because the data collection problem is something that will be solved with, with open telemetry, like how, how and what data. So we can really figure out and solve the problem that Brian, you just mentioned. How can we then convert this data mm -hmm. uh, into into answers and really focus and then also differentiate there, right? And how, and and that's going to be interesting. And yeah, I think mm -hmm. it's still a way to go, right? Because as open, even though it's open telemetry, it kind of looks like skyrocket adoption. Uh, it will still take a while until uh, we, we we have it in a state where we can just purely rely on open telemetry. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's going to be good. Yep, good future. All right, awesome. Well, then, Daniel, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I was a bit quiet today, but it was, I think, a lot for me to learn on today's episode for sure. Uh, plus, I was still stuck. I couldn't stop thinking about you dancing around on the moon doing the, the salsa, uh, the dancing on the moon. Uh, but to any of our listeners, you know, if you have any questions, comments, topics, feel free to, you know, send us an email at pure underscore DT. Uh, and love to hear from you. And uh, thank you, everybody. 